endless place, everything is eternal <laughs> and bland. Nothing can be changed here. It all hums in terrible clarity. With no wind to transform, modify or shift anything. Feathers fall from a plucked chicken and make a neat circle that stays and stays. There's a leaden singularity to each thing, each color immobile. Everything has become too important here, like something stared at too long. Until it might as well be anything, a person could go mad. As my mother combed my hair this morning, each broken strand slung down and coiled where it fell, separate and smug as edge spirals on the floor. Bride. What is it to be a bride here in this windless place? A bleached column? A sliver of standing bone? But perhaps that will not happen. Nothing can happen here, I think. It is a place of dead air. We came down from the hot rock mountains, everything creaking on the backs of our animals, their flanks straining to keep from falling. And as we descended, I thought to myself, a world of men. What kind of place am I taking, my darling? A place of idle soldiers, the most dangerous kind? Spears over sharpened by boys burning to kill for the first time. A man. A man. One of those boys, one of those eager, beardless, ignorant, hopped up, lonely bastards is waiting for her. And he will take her from me because he can. I looked back. There she was behind me, squinting through the dust we had kicked up, looking down, waiting for something to see, something to make sense. She's taller than I remember. She's strong enough, I suppose. So we kept on descending. Nothing more useless than ships, miles. Could it be miles of them? <laughs> Lined up, hauled up, tilting, impossible. Nose in the water that barely moves as if the ocean were some bloated pond. That was what I saw first. So many useless ships, bristling for such a distance along a flaccid shore. <laughs> That was before my occupation became clear. My occupation is something which is visible. Because then we descended to walk among the men. Cities full. All of them watching me. What do they see? I wonder. I am like Medusa. I change men to silent stone. Games stop, stories break at their starts, and nothing stirs as I pass, only their eyes turning in their sockets. Such silence, such level dust. I am some phantom, no one in this dress. I am not here, I am just some spell that is cast. It is a powerless power, <laughs> like this wind, which is only remarkable in its absence. Achilles, well, one hears stories, of course, but where is this man? How long have we been here, yesterday and today, and still no one sorts himself out of this murmuring, dirty mob to present himself? Watch for the armor, I'm told. It is priceless. You'll know it when you see it. As if that meant anything. His armor. 
helmets, lances, gold and iron skins they have, and me in this thin dress. It's a predicament. I'm a queen, I said, and she's a princess. But these things have no meaning here. The old man dropped a plate of shriveled chicken on the wooden table and left without bowing. Then I became afraid. They killed a deer yesterday. I saw it while it was still running, stamping down the boughs, cracking its forest, spotting through the stricken trees suddenly so visible. There I go. I thought, run fast, but they caught it, of course, <laughs> and when they brought it in, limp and undignified, head lolling, I couldn't watch. I turned away, <laughs> because the eyes were open, and they saw me, <laughs> Dad, they saw me. You and me, I thought, we know each other. <laughs> They offered me the heart, nice of them, I guess. But I said something and backed away. They watched me, of course, all the way to the tent. So many eyes glittering in the firelight, fixed on me diminishing until the flap swallowed me and I became invisible again and they could turn back and eat. I hold the darkness to my face as if it were food. He finally appears out of the crowd. I recognize him by his armor. My husband harried and awed in his movements. He knows nothing, apparently. What is to be done on this windless shore with an idle navy that he seems so busy? I ask him to leave. He makes me nervous. He's happy to do so. Now I can't sleep. But something is wrong. My parents thrash at each other in the woods, out of your shot. But there is screaming. Mother comes back, eyes swollen, face streaked, and smashes my head to her breast, squeezing my ribs. I can't breathe. I am so dear to her. Father stood in the tent for a while yesterday. He looks ill and won't meet my eyes. He won't touch me. Who is this husband? What is this marriage? Tonight the ritual knives are being sharpened on stone. Tonight, there are figures circling the fire, all in black, telling hymns I don't know. What kind of marriage are we preparing? I thought I would wear flowers, but nothing grows here. I thought there would be women. There are no women. Are there no other girls in the world? Suddenly, I am the last and only girl. And all these turning faces, all these anxious, idle fingers, all these men to satisfy. <laughs> this is the bride, the only bride. Morning comes, and I am a white dress, walking up the Kremlin cliff as if I know where I'm going, what I'm doing, to meet him, whoever he might be. I am ascending to the altar. I look down from a great height to see how the ships still lie, splayed like broken teeth. Today the light is merciless and sound would travel if there was sound but there are only my feet on the pebbles 
that hurl themselves down to the ships as I pass. I come to the altar, but there is no one. Just the black shrouded priest. And there my father, who has made his face a stranger, eyes locked in their sockets dull as coal. And a knife. Where are all the animals? Poor innocents, with the last cropped grass still in their moist mouths. But there's only me, and all the eyes are on me, visible me. This is a terrible place. Something must be done. See, I was right. Here is my husband. This ancient stone. And the quick shadow of the knife. I am to marry everyone. Every single one. This is what it is at last. Look at me. Everyone else is asleep, but I'm always awake. Rats scuttling in the wainscoting. In their heads, too. Even as they dream, I know even there. Listen. What is that sound? Mama filing her nails, polishing her teeth, setting down her tools, click, click, picking them up, click, click making her face. What is that sound? A thumping, a scraping. Oh, it's Electra. Digging up the garden, rooting all the plants, making grave after empty grave for my father's absent corpse. The place looks like a bonsai now. Look at it. Gaping, misshapen holes, scalloped by her fingers, broken nails pawing, where flowers once were, flowers I planted. She dumps them in the naked mud, and they fall together, roots exposed, dying already. She squats in the mud, making more graves. The rain begins to come down, and she's working remarkably swiftly now. Mud streaked through her hair, her face, her arms, and down her dress. The holes fill with winked brown water, and she scrambles up the side like a nimble pig. Suddenly she stops, only to look up to make sure that I am watching. She smiles at me. This is what she wants. That I'll always be watching from some high, clean place. This is my importance, I see. Oh, God. My wrecked garden. And listen. My father, the swan, taught me how to give birth to perfect things. I am heroic and extraordinary. I astonish myself. I stand in the tree and reach between my legs, and there, I have made an egg. It is dove gray and smooth, and its shape is the one true thing in existence. I place it against my cheek. There is the sound of a curved fingernail scratching. She unfurls herself like a sweet pea blossom and stands beside me, tall and breathing. 
We hold hands. Oh, wait. Another egg. I must let go of this child, this wonder, to reach my hands again between my legs for the sticky pink roundness, a slipshod copy of the first gray perfection. I tap it with my finger, and a pale good girl creeps out. I did not need another, but she is here and already clinging. What? Another egg already cramping my belly? Is there no end to this? I reach again. What is this horror? A misshapen oblong like a tortured walnut, a cracking like teeth on bone and it emits itself, all bald eyes and scrabbling hands. Is it female? What does it matter? It does nothing but stare and stare at me. It is already injured. But a final, a fourth has dropped uncaught out of me. It cracks itself open on the ground far below. Perhaps it's dead. Good. What a long fall. But no, a boy looking up, armed and agile. Where is my girl, my gray egg child, the only one I ever wanted? But she has flown forever while these other mistakes grapple themselves to me, pulling me down. There is no trace of her in the sky, and the boy begins his ascent up the tree. He is sure-footed, the tip of his spear flashing. He will come. You see, I am their condition. I am the rabid dog who tethers herself in their garden. Mongrel old bitch, howling at moons, at suns, at stars, at it all. That's what I do. I'm impossible, ask anyone. I'm the creation battered on this anvil of insanity, this place smelling of blood, of slaughter, of helplessness. They cannot get rid of me. I cannot get rid of me. I make everything happen. How did you sleep? Badly. You, again really nauseate me, greasy and black. You're like the ravens and crows that shit on the pediments and shriek and dive at the windows. Unsightly, brutish mess. Let me get upwind of you. You might at least bathe. And you, what are you anymore? You gave your face away, you sold on the butcher's block, you called the family hearth. Look at you propping your sagging carcass up, stinking of your rotting beauty, and even as you stink, you stamp and flirt your pointless feathers. What have you done to the clocks? Two have stopped, three run crazy in their circles, and the rest won't stop chiming. They are reckoning the hour of your death, which is now and always. Nothing will ever work right until then. The house has been holding its breath for twenty years, waiting for judgment. Then let them chime another twenty. Your brother, your dear fiction, will never return in my lifetime. Oh yes, in my lifetime and yours, although just barely in yours, rather near the end. And for me, life will have just begun. You don't have the strength for vengeance. I figured that out a long time ago. And you're useless otherwise. You'll die here having accomplished nothing, not even a rat-faced child to mourn you. Merely an irritation first to last. Tick, tick, tick. You don't have it in you to do anything by yourself. I am my mother's daughter. You should be terrified of me. This knife, Restor's blood on the blade, you tell me. This very knife, how did you hold it? My hands are so like yours, show me the grip. Ooh. 
like this girl, like this, and brought it down 20 times at least on his old man's chest. And what did you scream? Liar! Fell! Butcher! Liar! Filth! Butcher! Have you no originality? Raise your arms higher, girl. You'll need the force of a long swing. I did. His chest was wide. Higher! Don't you look silly. I hope I didn't look that silly. I don't think so. I could see how I looked in his open eyes as I brought the blade down. Give me back the knife, you're hopeless. Hopeless. You shall get it back someday. I am so bored with you. I gave birth to a shrike and she stiff-legged after me year after year, dropping dull feathers and muttering, Always in the way, an embarrassment. You're right. I'm warped and noisome, spewed from the womb of the crimes I've seen. <laughs> the crimes you've seen? What? A little blood? A bloated cipher of a man you didn't know? Creaking in rusty armor up the path from the harbor. What did you know of him? Did he even touch you? Did you even speak? He didn't have time. You killed him before I could know him. I saw the flash of his teeth when he smiled. I saw how tired he was. I knew him well. Let me tell you what he was. He was a pretty boy and a bully, rich and pampered. His men didn't trust him. He knew that. He wanted their love more than anything else. To be one of the boys, pathetic so that when it came to killing his own child, his own daughter, he did it like a braggart, grinned at them as he held up the bloody knife, and they cheered for him obligingly, slightly stunned, faintly disgusted, but relieved. It was just a girl, they thought. Still, it was his. Well, it didn't bear thinking about. The wind was up, and they could go forth to the bloodletting. That was enough. And I watched the sails heave and creak, their swollen bellies disappearing out to sea as I held her on the sand, her warm body, new breasts tight, long fingers hardening, the soft head swinging the neck open and undone. They say he vomited later in whatever privacy a ship bristling with soldiers affords, like a drunkard into the bushes, like the man he was. Who cares? That is the father you weep for. Someone with a knife, his own daughter. She could have been you. How often I wished it had been you he'd call for. If only he had not asked me for the best of me. The only perfect thing I ever made. My oldest, my only child. Ah, uh, but then she would have been there standing next to my place at the butcher's block and she would have been here instead of me hating you. I would never have killed him for your sake. I killed him for hers. You see how the inevitable holds us in her hands. So here we are. My dead against your dead, my love against your love, my history against your history. In perpetuity. We wait. You've had your just stuff yet to have mine. Hello, girls. What? At it so early. Lovely day, pink still. I laid out a meal, not that anyone's interested. Dishes, plates, things to stop the mouth. But somehow I knew. Not today. When I woke up this morning, I thought, oh, something's wrong again. Today we won't be behaving like human beings. Today, no one will sit down. You always did have a flair for the mundane. There is, she's right. <laughs> Something about today. Already I can smell it. Myrtle, is it? 
death. <laughs> Perhaps something will finally happen. No, <laughs> not in this life. This pallid little female life we run out together. Everything of importance has happened and happened long ago, elsewhere and without us. We are not part of history, women. We three birds, circling empty air, cawing and jibing, hovering over a plot of dirt and unwanted circumference, a patch of mud. There's nothing to be scraped out of this place, this wasteland we call home, but our own graves. And there we will tumble soon enough and mingle our teeth with the roots and pebbles and lie there unwarned, unremembered, and nasty as manure. We were never part of the great drama. No one was ever looking. All these years, the gods have been watching over the battles, the fields of Troy, harbors and camps, and the dark-haired figures on the pediments. Scraping of chariots, wheels turning, death and battle. We are always at the edge of importance. We learn our news from the mud-spattered boys, days late, stammering rumors. We wait out our lives, waiting for action, waiting for justice. Houses of women. Speak for yourself, girl. While you were doing finger exercises at the piano, I was running a country. I have always been at the center of the drama, and I never waited for anything except rightness. The moment, the true beauty of the crafted event. And then I did it. <laughs> Until now, what is there left to do except wait with us for your death? Isn't that right? Did you shiver just now? No. <laughs> Perhaps it's some sort of palsy starting. You are getting on, so we should begin to expect these things. First the body, then the mind. Or perhaps the other way around. Which do you think will go first? Shall we take bets? I'll tell you what will go first. You. There is something about this day. You're right. Actions can be taken on a day like today. Finally, something will be done. Don't you hate her? She's just a woman. A murderer. But I always assumed that she was crazy. And that makes it all right. It makes her pitiable and dismissible. I don't have to figure her out. She's not like me. Then how do you deal with me? Oh, well, I always thought that you were crazy, too. That makes you endurable. I see. So you're the sane one. Such martyrdom, trapped in the saggy mantra, too shrew screaming over your bowed head at the dinner table. Something like that. While you comb your hair, wash out your simple dresses, hum your tunes and carry on, shaking your head at the sad, preposterous shambles we have become. The pretty one. The one everyone likes. The one no one worries about. I'm not frightening. I'm the good girl. Everyone pities me. I'm so reliable. I learned how to push my own prayer in the summer you wouldn't stop crying. Do you know that you cried for nearly three months straight? Nothing could be done with you. A jam buzzsaw. Life was impossible. So I crawled out of my pram on notice and pushed myself into the garden and stayed there. No one looked for me. Or I would close the door to my room and remain undiscovered for 24 hours. And when I would come out, someone would sign and have me you dripping and gabbling about something or him. I was, I am, unremarkable. No one ever asked me a question. Not once in my life. No one's ever been curious about what I might be thinking or feeling. No one's ever said, what did you see? Where were you when it happened? What do you remember? What do you feel? What did you see? What do you remember? What did you feel? I don't know. I don't remember. All I remember is what you and she have told me. I remember your memories. 
No. Was I there? Did I see it? Tell me. I don't know. All I know is that I did. Yes, and how can I not hate you for that? To know that you existed. Well, I don't remember you, so perhaps you didn't. No. I never did. I look at the family pictures and I'm always on the margin, smudged by your dirty fingerprint. Could be anybody in that fell dress. Your thumb across my face, our little historian. Well, somebody had to be. Everyone else is dead or disappeared. And you, so placid, so stoic, such a bore. What are you doing in a family like ours? You are utterly useless. Me? And what about you? You've done nothing, not one thing in your life. You think we could get something out of you, having to put up with your insults and yammering year after year, a little light housekeeping at least, an occasional botched dinner, but no. People ask and I think, well, she must be doing something. But I have no idea. <laughs> I remember. I remember. I remember. I have not chosen this. I would have never have chosen this, to spend my life as a vessel for one impossible truth. But that is my condition. I've carried it like a dragon inside me. It is was alive, not me. I feel it flip and slap its hard tail against me, or rub its teeth along the tender pink walls of me. This creature's song keeps me open-eyed and walking all night long. Do you think I would have chosen this? How would you ever live differently? What could change this? Justice. But my dear monster, there is no justice, only life. You must finally wake up to that. He will come. He will never come. <laughs> then you must help me. Of course I won't. Because you're a coward. Actually, I don't think I am a coward. You are. I'm merely a pragmatist. I won't do it because it won't work. We've discussed this. One more corpse, one more murder, and we're sucked back into the maw of history. Generations after generations throwing their bodies in the name of what? Justice. It is not for us to render that. What is justice anyway? Your idea? Nothing more. Perhaps there's nothing like justice in nature. The nature is appalling. We can do better. I think you're naive. Of course you are. You never had to grow up. I was the only one who had to. Her brother remains here, some phantom man-child that we dreamed into an Avenger. You were no less a phantom, no less a child, just taller, louder, and just still stuck at the hurt side, blood still wet on the stone, his screams echoing in the air, and you stand there, mouth open, hands empty. It's just that you walk around and dog our steps and eat sometimes so we forget that you're really just a ghost and that you never grew up. You know nothing of life. You know your little corner of history and you fingered it and fluttered it in our faces until it's unreadable fate knots us and probably wrong to begin with anyway. What I know, I know absolutely. It has made me, everything I am is that knowledge. But what are you? A white-faced maniac. Someone who has welcomed nowhere, someone who has never actually lived. You have wasted your life, whatever life you could have had, and broken your only body in bitterness and hatred. You've debased what could have been a subtle and complicated mind until now. It's nothing but a hurdy-gurdy you crank to drone one notion, one memory, one impulse into action never taken. Have you thought of the, that? All this talk of justice and history and all you ever could have been is someone who just hated life. Why not kill yourself? If I believe for a second what you believe, that there's no such thing as justice in this world, then I would kill myself. Certainly. What would be the point of me? But what I know is that I'm the guardian of this truth and I'm here to see it honored. The world will never forgive us if we do not make sense of it. What I've suffered only has meaning if I continue to suffer it. I am necessary. I believe that. My death would release me, but bring down history and crashing ruin. I wouldn't notice. No, you wouldn't. You merely sigh and go for the dustpan. Then again, you become virtuosic in obliviousness. And I look at you. Haggard, 
and rank, and I think the only thing that she has ever accomplished is that she has ruined her own life. That's not true. I've also ruined hers. I've been thinking. Oh dear, not again. Considering your future, as a mother does, what do you think families like ours do with girls like you? Ignore them? Hope they don't embarrass us at parties. Dress them up as best they can. Endure them privately. Invent vague maladies. Turn down their inventations out by saying, not feeling quite up to it. Packing for a trip abroad. Summer camp. Swiss Academy. But you, you just kept growing, didn't you? And now you're this hulking, nearly middle-aged monstrosity who's never been anywhere, never did anything, just aged and aged and continued. You know what families like ours really do with girls like you, don't you? What we should have done long ago, what we will do now at last, wall you up in an attic or basement somewhere. Let your howling caroom off the walls with no one to hear you. Let you shit yourself. There are people who don't know you, who won't listen to you, who don't even speak your language, who will tend you. They'll throw you food from doorways, shut you from the light, turn away from your screaming to play cards with each other, never think of you, never dream of you, never be hurt by you. That is what people like us do with the wild girls of families like ours. We have the money. We have the hatred. I think, in fact, that would be the very best thing all around, don't you? I'll take you there myself. This afternoon, perhaps, after I pick up the dry cleaning, God, the smell out here. No. Oh, why not? I'll ride on walls with my blood. I'll gnaw on the bars and dull my teeth. I'll bang my lice-ridden head on the floor and howl and howl. Narrating my history to the air. Telling my one story again and again. It'll all be the same to me. And perhaps if I'm lucky, sonality will loosen the past. And, and there will come a time when the faces will blur. I'll confuse yours with household dogs we once had, and hers with fairy tale monsters. <laughs> it's his with imaginary friends I once played with, princes I dreamed about. And perhaps my father will seem to be a tree, perhaps, silent and high, gnarled and immortal, shading some happy kingdom I might visit in death. You see, there's nothing she can do to me that'd be worse than what she has already done. She unstrung my life from the beginning. Nothing ever made sense again. What she doesn't know is that I'm stronger than she can ever hope to be. She lives in fear. Me, what I'm most afraid of has already happened. The smell of burning is in the air carry to us from the battlefields that we never see. A hush of buildings, of bodies, of children. Find us here. Drop itself exhausted in the fears of our field and spring is false again. We bear nothing. We bear all. We are blind to what is killing us. But we smell it in the wind. I had a brother, so the story goes. Another child in the household kicking his feet under the table, banging a spoon, having ideas. Dark he was, and different from the rest of us. Only in his sex. He always knew that he would leave that table. The four corners of the yard, walk about. He read a boat and pictured himself on the prowl, eyes on the horizon. While we, the others, traced the rigging picture with our fingers and yawned at what it would be for lunch. 
us, the world. We let them screech and run and flail a tin sword, make threats in the nursery, jump from windows. We talked over him and touched him in passing as he touched us in passing. And so it was in the end, we lost them to the world, like we lost all the men. We never knew him at all, any more than he knew or we knew our own father. A man, a crunch of boots down the path away from you. Badly written letters smudged by unimaginable hands and weather. To someone you think you are from someone you think you might want them to be. Men exit such places as this and never come again. Or if they do come back, like my father, they come back bearded and changed, distracted and absent as they are here, stand a moment blinking in the courtyard and quickly dispatched into the next world. My mother was right. He was an impossibility in such a place as this. God. How depressing. A ghost town. Gaping with stillness. Occasional dog, chicken duck. Shutters closed. Containing dust and teapots. Stifling. World of women. No color, no music, no sound. Every other house muffled in mourning. The obligatory plaque gave of our best, precious son, beloved husband. Given for what? A moronic, terrified officer's gesture? A foot of foreign mud? And here, a house that has taken much and given more. Ought to achieve this grim garden. A roof that still leaks in another few years of tarnish on the unused silver. House of Women. What? Yet more killing to be done? Their dead son, their darling murderer, has returned at last. Is this the house? What house are you looking for? I bring terrible news. This is the house. Orestes, son of this house, is dead. I was his companion. Oh. Here are his ashes. Do you have a gun? No, I'm not a soldier anymore. <laughs> well, what use are you? You might at least have killed me. Who are you? No one now. <laughs> I used to be someone's sister. First, that was someone's daughter, but that was over a long time ago. Then I was someone's sister. That was enough to get me up in the morning. Years and years. Now I'm what? A thing of some sort, I suppose. Something you might hang up in the field to frighten the crows, I guess. There must be some use for such a large thing. I'm sure they'll think of something. Are you Electra? Well, I suppose we might as well name it. Pretty name. I have his ashes. Oh, well, those will come in handy. Drainage for the tomatoes. Fill over a bad pie crust. How light he is. <laughs> Heavier than an idea, which is all he ever was, I guess. Nothing. He has come to nothing after all. <laughs> Ashes. <laughs> is that a tooth? <laughs> I remember his smile. His hair bright and long in the summer. How must have curled and fizzed in the furnace. This was a man once. Yes. Hardly seems possible. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> he was such a funny child. He used to imitate me. He'd stalk about the parlor, muttering to himself the way I do. Pretend to trip. Pride himself. Trip again. <laughs> I can't explain it. He made me laugh. Did he make you laugh? 
Oh, yes. I laugh at him all the time. He struck me as somewhat ludicrous. He was something of an actor. Was he? Taking on parts. Pretending to be people he wasn't. Did he imitate you? Yes, and I imitated him. We were right. Did you love him? As much as he loved himself. Did you know him well? No one did. He was somewhat severed from his own life. It seemed he died many times, perhaps in a way he was always dead. Did he ever speak of home, of us, of me? He spoke of you. He spoke of a duty and a terror and a guilt. He never spoke of home. Was this his home? No, not his. Mine either, for that matter. We both of us die in exile. What did he say about me? That you were the one that saved him. Did he love me? He didn't know much about love. He knew something about blood. He was fearless and cruel in battle. And he could look coolly at sights that made other men scream or vomit. He could do things to people that don't bear thinking about. We were afraid of him. You hated him. A little. A lot. He was utterly alone in the world and he never looked back. And because of that, he was dangerous. He sounds very useful. Efficient in battle. He slept alone. He had terrible dreams. Nightmares. They woke him screaming, teeth chattering, pants soiled. Did he tell you what he dreamed? Something about being pushed down an endless, lightless tunnel. I got smaller and smaller. Forced to crawl with a knife in his teeth, pushed like rags into a gun barrel, and the walls getting tighter and tighter around him. What was at the end of the tunnel? Something warm, dark, soft, and enormous that he would have to climb inside of and slice and slice, drown in the blood or maybe slither out of, crawl away from, blinded by blood, maddened by bats. What was it, did he say? What was it that was pushing him? You. Uh, terrible dream. It was what he saw when he closed his eyes. Always. Right there. Who is this in my hand? Your brother. So you say. Dark sunlight, alas, I have driven you mad. Yes, and I have driven you mad. Yes, and who better than the killer now than her two mad children? We will cavort and jewel and treat prophecies and gibberish. We'll be free and appalling, happy and appalling, free at last. Poor Electra. They're terrible eyes. They have been open too long. Like yours. I'm tired of killing. I'm tired of waiting. Let's just go to sleep somewhere, finally. Let the years go by. Let's curl into each other the way we used to do. Make new dreams. Not yet. Your work isn't over. Let me sleep. No. I can't raise my arm again. Only once more, that's all. Like this. Hi. Hi. You know how. You do it. God, why haven't you done it? You've had time enough. I can't. It's for you. You have the hatred. I'm past it. You can do it. No, I can't. If I could have done it long ago, don't you think I would have done it already? God, the misery could have saved myself. All these years waiting for you who never came, never wrote. All these years thinking of you out in the world, loose, knowing things, seeing people, looking at something, anything other than this. I pictured you in Africa, standing in a marketplace, colors all around you, languages buzzing, Monkeys chattering and scrambling over you while you drank something hot and sweet or bit into some strange fruit that dripped on the ground. I was never in Africa. You were at sea somewhere. Shirt sticking to your back, watching the sky go crimson and enormous. It was never like that. Ditch to ditch, death to death, that's all. What you have done, what you have become while I drag my skirt around the yard year after year, becoming nothing, a middle-aged child eaten up by this, this nightmare. Please, free me. You owe me. I gave you your life for this, only for this. Yes, I know. And for this, my life, Pilot, thank you. You have no idea what you've made me into. What do you think it's been like for me? Yapping on the ground like a severed head for 20 years, nothing but eyes and tongue, waiting, waiting for my reluctant body to finally come back to me and do something. Here. My hand, my arm, 
completely. Oh, Electra. We should have kept our eyes closed. Sir? I bring terrible news, madam. Your son is dead. Cut down in his glory, a great sacrifice. I'm sorry. How? While leading in charge, he fell from his horse and was dragged out into no man's land. I crawled out later that night to find him there tangled in the reins. A terrible death, but heroic, lit by his valor. Sad. I'm taking it well, wouldn't you say? You look like a boy who knows of his way around death and how people take it. My son. Hmm. And his horse. I'm sorry? What happened to his horse? Well, the horse died too. <sighs> Tragic. Dumb animals, the suffering of the innocent Hardly seems fair. Sorry? Getting animals mixed up in such a loathsome thing. War. What did they know about it? What did they ever do to us? How confusing and terrifying it must be for a horse, a, a creature like that. All the noise, the shouting of the dying, the cannons. It's awful. Why should they suffer as we do? No justice. Y excuse me. You look terrible. You must be tired, famished. People must eat. We must have something in the house, don't we? Jello, vodka, Ritz crackers, something? Hello, sunshine. Not a very good day for you all around, I'd say. You look flushed. Nice to see some color in your cheeks, though. Awfully quiet. Uncharacteristic. Never one to keep one in suspense about what she's feeling. Well, bright eyes. Let's give the man what he came for. Oh, by all means. Such a long journey with such a lot of words in his mouth. Goodness, they must have been heavy. Dead horses, valor and all. May I touch you? I'm sorry? Oh, no, no need to be, no need. Such a great round head. How it must have hurt your mother butting through. I remember what I thought at the time. I screamed, I believe. Well, one does. But you see, I thought I was giving birth to the moon. His head, a great pallid thing with a face on it that would watch me through all my nights and never really go away. See? Even now, the sun is up and yet, yes, there it is, like a dim coin of some kind. You can never really get away from it. Well, perhaps tonight, hmm? Come, my egg. Let's see if we can find what you came for in this house. What a strange day. The weather can't seem to make up its mind. Shall we rain? Shall we be pleasant? The sunlight has a dull metallic glint to it. And the wind is upsetting the grass, running it backwards. Earthquake weather. The 
the teacups were quivering in their saucers, and I thought, oh, it's just the war. It's silent. Have you noticed? Not a sound. I can't hear anything. Whatever it is, it's happening far, far away and out of earshot. Perhaps we'll hear it on the news tonight. Is it odd? How one can go throughout a day and nothing out of the ordinary happens, but at the end, you, yes, you hear of the enormous events that have taken place. Stock markets crashing, landslides, handshakes, train wrecks. And one thinks, what was I doing at that time? Folding sheets, ironing, planning dinner. While millions died, while the world came to an end, what was I doing at that time? Making a sandwich. Digging a grave. Humming a childhood song. Sharpening an axe. Yawning. Preparing the ground. Changing a light bulb. <laughs> Counting the seconds. Opening a can. Making it happen. Looking in the wrong direction. <laughs> Making it happen. Making it happen there. That's where it was. There, me. Without me, nothing would have ever have happened. to the air, trying to remember a terrible dream.
I was never really a woman, and now I will never have the chance. I never really lived, and now I'm immortal. They say I was spirited away at the moment of the knife. Some deer died in my place, but it looked like me to me at any rate. It was disorienting. I rose up out of myself, looking down at the figure on the stone. She's so young, I thought. Beautiful, in a way. But then I forgot about her. Because of the press of air and light, the fact of traveling at such a high speed, intoxicating. This is death, I thought. Just another trip to an unknown place to meet a stranger. And it seems I was right. Because this is a sort of heaven. The kind of place someone might have thought I would like. Safety, certainly. And a nice view. Who knew it would be so dull? I'm the keeper of a shrine on a wild island. I'm surrounded by girls. Who are all alike because we are all homesick for grief. Which is to say, life. No one to dress up for here. Just the unseen gods. No one to kiss. No crowds at the marketplace. No news. Nothing to talk about, really. I guess we should be happy. We are girls forever. And we are all rather pretty and white. And life is scorchingly uneventful. It's just that sometimes one dreams. And that can get you into trouble. Because you remember life in dreams. Noises, voices, cries. Colors that buzz up against each other. Things to touch. The skin of oranges. The cheek of a lover. Books. Tools. Paper. There is nothing to touch here. Except each other. And we are all too sad for that. This is privilege. We can't help wondering what we might have become without it. If we'd been left alone. If I hadn't been so bloody special. I think I was fairly bright. Observant, at least. Maybe that was the problem. I can't help feeling that I was put away just when I threatened to become interesting. Just when I started feeling things out of the ordinary. Bleeding. Getting angry. Talking too loud. Too fast. Too much. I hear my mother killed my father on account of me. I was impressed. I didn't know I rated so much vengeance. But Mom, well, she was interesting. She lived long enough, and I'm sure she's dead by now. No woman can afford to be that interesting. I wish I'd been that interesting. Now I am something made of stone, handsome, bleached, and perpetual. We are stand-ins for Artemis. Who is too busy to be a stone. She's off hunting and conniving. Running. Being impressive. That would be fun. Knowing something. Feeling the muscle that pulls the bow top. Judging distance. Accomplishing things. Like Greece. What did we know of Greece? Or life. We think of Greece. And it really is what we didn't quite see, hear, touch. But what we sensed. We were girls there. Pivish girls on the threshold of consciousness hurried past what was essential. We remember the cities and what we see are corners not walked around, dark doorways like open mouths we would not pass through, but wondered. Conversations held belly out of earshot so that we heard sounds, sibilance, scattered syllables, but not the sense, muted colors of a life seen through a veil. And now we are all still guessing, just at a greater distance, at a terrible height. Oh, and here's the irony. If a man should reach us at this place, we are supposed to kill him. But all we want to do is speak to him. Ask questions. Touch him. And I do, but only at the point of a knife. I feel their necks from which would issue answers. But no. We terrify them with our whiteness. Bind them in robes. The way market wives bind vegetables. And then I say something or other, and the knife comes down. And we'll land ourselves in silence once more. The seabirds call. Rise and fall on currents of clean air. And we have served something. The silenced male body. Offered up to something. Just as I was offered. It has a sort of 
a circular and inevitable a sense to it i suppose oh that's a madman on the beach look at him he seems to be attacked by phantoms birds is it how he screams you can almost hear it <laughs> covering his head and running rolling in the sand to get away from what now would be the time to bind and bring him go What terrible suffering actual people endure. Look at life. A man trying to run away from his own head. I've heard of such things, what wars do to people. They cannot escape the moment, the horrifying moment, whatever it is, and they live inside of it forever. Even on a day like this. It's beautiful, of course. It always is. If he could only see it. Birds are more birds. Birds are more black or white. Black, 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 they're all female. Black. They're all female. What do the birds say? You have killed her. You cannot kill her. You have killed her. You cannot kill her. Who? My mother. Well, why would you do that? Everyone told me to. A god told me to. You always do what you're told? Yes. I was a soldier first, and for a long time, only recently a matricide. Ah, well, I'm a priestess. I'm equally gifted in compliance, and I'm also a girl, so. And just my luck. Obedience meets obedience. We'll probably end up killing each other. Funny you should say so. That's why you're brought to me. I'm supposed to kill you. Why? What I've been told to do. What god do you serve? Does it matter? Artemis. Oh. Then I serve Apollo. That's why I'm here. What did he want you to do here? Steal the statue of Artemis. Bring it back to Greece. Why? Who knows? I didn't ask. If I did it, he said he would get the Furies off my back. We're all statues of Artemis. Take all of us with you. We're insane with homesickness. You're supposed to kill me. Oh, I know. I shouldn't even be talking to you, but you interest me. I miss the sound of men's voices. We don't hear them much, and when we do, not for long. You are a sacrifice, you see. <laughs> I was always a sacrifice. From the time I was a child. Beaten into submission at the tune of fathers all my life. I was plunged into the arms of the military early on world of boys, muscled, fatted for sacrifice in the name of fathers, the name of countries, states, gods, told to obey, to lay down my life, my spirit to him, always to him, fathers. It was easy to kill her. I've done it so often. The quick Quieting of limbs, dulling of eyes, simple. What did I know about mothers? Everything that I've learned about mothers is what they've been screaming in my ears since the moment I did it. They strum my sinews like harps and sing about her. And this song, this pain, this madness, I am taught that when I took my mother's life, I made myself an exile to all nature. My sin, her blood, sears through the fabric of this world. What did I know about nature? It's not in my training. I was schooled in sacrifice as well, just of a different kind. The girl, the virgin, it made a kind of sense, didn't it? Oh, yes. The exchange. We knew it in our bloods. We are the necessary payment of the people. The negotiation with the mystery. Special ones. Were we special? Oh, yes. Terribly special.
I come from a house eccentric in blood. Eccentric in suffering. Lie upon lie. Generation upon generation. Aberrant. Pariahs. Netted up. Tight knots. And fate. And fate. I thought you looked familiar. And you. Blood knits us. Blood and service of blood. My poor sister. Our poor brother. Saved. Saved. Everything is watching. Everything up there. Hovering. Terrible. Invisible. We are performing a legend. And the legend is performing us. For what? In the name of what? Is it possible to become invisible at this late date? Oh, to be unimportant. To live without a script. Without duty. Oblivion. Oblivion. So, who shall hold the knife now? Which killing to echo? His of you? Mine of her. Or hers of him? Redress? Is it possible? I can't remember the sequence anymore. Just the deaths. I do. I murdered her last. If it's redress, you should kill me. Oh, I know. But it's just death now. No sense. Sacrifice. We have reached the threshold of futility. Own wall of history. End of sight. I have heard that a needle can be made to pass through stone. Tiny hole, inconsequential to the structure. Just large enough for these two odd lives. Somehow thread their way through into the open air. A different light, beyond bargains. Beyond exchange, beyond blood feuds. Justice. Justice. I am the statue you have come to find. Take me to the city, to the center of the city. Build noise and life around me. I will be silent and tall. I will remind them. I will seem to see everything. I will be female and slightly terrifying. I will be what I have always been, visible and mute. You will place me at the center of something, and you will lay your tortured head upon my cold feet, and you will finally sleep. This is how the legend performs itself to an end. I can do this for you. I can do this for you. And this will be the part that everyone will forget. The needle, the wall of history. Part of justice, which is merely... Personal. Inelegant. A quirk. A sliver of light. That is only... And finally... Something like love. <laughs>